Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marie McKee, and I'm president of the Corning Museum of Glass. We're really, really happy that you're here with us today. Beautiful day, and you're inside with us. Um, 2011 has been quite a year of change for us, and we thank David Whitehouse as he steps down as the executive director, and we welcome Carol White, our new executive director. Carol comes to us from the Getty Museum, where she was the senior curator of antiquities at the Getty Villa. For those of you who have just visited the Getty, or perhaps you're planning on that, you know that they have recently renovated the Getty Villa, and that was one of Carol's responsibilities there, the $250 million renovation of that facility. Carol is an internationally renowned specialist in Roman glass. Her book on ancient glassmaking techniques called Molten Color, Glassmaking and Antiquity was just published by the Getty in May, and we're gonna hear a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Carol received her PhD in art history from the University of California in Los Angeles and is a member of several international associations for the study of glass. Before her appointment as our executive director, this museum recognized her for her distinction in the world of glass by electing her as a fellow to the Corning Museum of Glass. So Carol is no stranger to us. She already knew many of our staff members and had done joint exhibitions with us between the Getty and the Corning Museum of Glass. So we are thrilled to have our um, museum have her join us, and we are delighted to welcome her as our new executive director. And now I know you're going to have a special treat to hear about her new book, Molten Color. Welcome, Carol. Thanks, Marie, and, and thank you, all of you, for coming out this afternoon. I'm pleased to see so many of you here, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to get to know you better as the years progress. I've only been here for three months, but it seems like quite a long time already. <laughs> Two hurricanes and a flood and an earthquake. <laughs> I don't think we have natural disasters that quickly in California, but uh, it was an interesting introduction to the community. So this afternoon, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about my book, uh, give you some insight into what went into writing it, tell you about uh, what the contents of this book is. And it's really very much about the history of glassmaking in antiquity. Uh, and it's always fun for me to address audiences in Corning, and particularly members at this museum, because you guys already know quite a bit about glass, having come here regularly. Uh, whereas audiences in Los Angeles are a little less familiar with that subject, so I have to do a bit of the basics with them, but not with you. So, without any further ado, uh, the first uh, thing I wanted to talk to you about was why this book came about. Um, the Getty Museum had an opportunity in 2000 and 2001 to acquire a private collection of ancient glass that had been formed in Germany. And it came to Los Angeles, and when the Getty Villa reopened in January 2006, it was the subject of one of the first special exhibitions at the Villa site. So on the right, you can see the exhibition banner for that exhibition, same title as the book cover. And it was really a chance to showcase uh, this wonderful collection of ancient Roman glass. It was formed by a man named Erwin Oppenlender, whose photograph you see on the right. He was a German industrialist who lived uh, just outside of Stuttgart. And in looking at the history of his collecting ancient glass, I surmise that he began his collecting probably in the late 1920s or early 1930s. And when he approached how to form his collection, he was extremely thorough and methodical in it. And by that, I mean that he was trying to acquire examples of the full breadth of glassmaking in antiquity. He was interested in purchasing pieces that were made in all different techniques and really in finding the most beautiful pieces that he could acquire. His collection was put on view in 1974 and 75 in um, Cologne and in Hamburg. And you see the exhibition catalog on the left there. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the collection before launching into the book. 
Uh, for the Getty, it was extremely important to find uh, more works of ancient Roman glass. It was really the last part of the antiquities collection that needed to be fully developed. We had put together a very fine assemblage of Greek vases, Roman sculpture, all of the other representative types of ancient art. Uh, but glass was always the one area in which we were lacking. In fact, for about 20 of my 25 years at the Getty, I was working with a collection of about 40 pieces. So I kept waiting for the day when I would have a larger collection to work with. And lo and behold, the, Op uh, the Oppenlender collection became available. By the time Mr. Oppenlender died in 1988, he had put together a collection of about 1,200 objects. So it was vast. And it was divided between his son and daughter at his death. And what the Getty purchased was actually the son's portion of the collection. But even dividing it in half, it still encompassed all of these fabulous objects. And so as I said, the Getty, having none, was very anxious to acquire quite a bit. Uh, included amongst the examples of ancient glass were Egyptian pieces, which was an area in which the Getty did not really collect. The only Egyptian material in the collection was from the time when Rome began to rule Egypt, but nothing from the pharaonic period. So we suddenly have our earliest examples of Egyptian glass. It encompassed a, a large collection of core-formed vessels from the earliest examples to uh, later production in the Hellenistic period. And I show you two Greek examples here. It also included a wonderful variety of cast vessels, including those from the Achaemenid culture of ancient Persia, as well as from Greece and from Rome. And a truly spectacular collection of mosaic glass from the Hellenistic and Roman periods. And this bowl that I'm showing here was one of my absolute favorites. Uh, I sincerely love the way this bowl was crafted. And it's interesting to look at the composition of this piece because the glassmaker who assembled these mo mosaic cane slices to construct this vessel chose a very simple pattern of blue with a white central dot. But when he was slumping it over his hemispherical mold to shape this bowl, he kept it in the heat long enough for the white to begin running instead of saying as a polka dot, if you will. So the result is this really lively bowl in which the white moves across the surface and through the blue in a really spectacular fashion. And every time I look at this, having lived near the ocean for 20 years, I think of sea anemones sort of swaying in the surf. It's really beautiful. Another wonderful area that was quite developed was Roman mold-blown glass. And this, uh, for Mr. Oppenlander, I think, was actually a major achievement. Because mold-blown glass is a bubble that's inflated into a mold and takes on a pattern, it's a type of glass that is meant to replicate. You can make 50 examples of the same type. Um, but rather than collect large numbers of mold-blown glass, Mr. Oppenlender really tried to find unique examples and make sure he didn't replicate himself. So he put together 30 or 40 pieces, each of which are unique designs uh, and really wonderful examples of the type. And lastly, all of the examples of free-blown glass, mold, um, inflated glass, decorated in a variety of techniques. And you see a number of examples here on the screen from plain undecorated wares to a spectacular splashware vessel in the center. This is a vessel that's called a modiolus. Uh, technically, it's kind of a measuring cup, if you will. Uh, and great examples on the right of pinched pieces and um, pieces decorated by winding trails over the surface of the vessel, a variety called snake thread glass, because it looks like snakes moving across the ground. As I mentioned earlier, the breadth of this collection was astonishing, because it really did begin with some of the earliest examples of man-made glass, Mesopotamian pieces from the second millennium. Uh, as you can see, there's a pendant of Astarte on the left, and Corning actually has a wonderful example of this same pendant type up on view in the Origins Gallery, so I'd encourage you to go up and look at that if you're not familiar with it. And on the right, uh, we see an example of Islamic glass because his collection really ended in the 11th or 12th century. Now, the Getty doesn't collect Islamic glass. We have no larger Islamic collection in which to fit it, so much of this material remains in storage. 
but we were able to collaborate with our colleagues at the Los Angeles County Museum and actually lend them this bowl on the right so that they could incorporate it into their Islamic displays. So I'm happy that it's on view. The technical breadth of this collection is also really astounding. We've talked a little bit about some of the, um, the types of glass that are represented chronologically. And it really covers everything from cast to core formed to mosaic to facet cut and finely etched. There's a single example of painted glass that you can see here in the center. Wonderful examples of ribbon glass and even the very rare gold band glass. Where's my pointer? There it is. There were three pieces of this that were acquired. So with the acquisition of this great collection of glass and presenting it to the public really for the first time in 30 years, I was approached by the Getty Museum's publisher, Greg Britton, who wanted me to do a book about glass because this exhibit was extremely popular and we had it on view when the villa opened in 2006. It was meant to be up for a year, so we took it down. It was in a gallery for changing exhibitions. And whenever we had a gap in the sequence, we would put the glass back up. And the public response to this material was really phenomenal. Everyone really enjoyed looking at it. Um, I think you as members here visiting the collections understand the kind of personal connection that you can form with ancient glass. We use glass today, so there's an immediate link. So he approached me and said, would you like to do a picture book on ancient glass? And I said, I'd love to do a picture book on ancient glass, but can it have some content too? And he said, yes, it can. So I was able to put together really a book for uh, our general visitor who would come in the door not really knowing much about glass. So the first goal of the book was really to answer the question, what is glass, to make sure that people understood what the raw materials are that go into making glass. I wanted to provide a chronology of glass making techniques and styles from antiquity. Oops. There we go. And to talk about the use of glass in ancient societies because uh, what a lot of our visitors didn't really realize was that in antiquity glass was used much the same way we use it today. So. There's a lot of drinking vessels on the tables in here, not to mention the centerpieces, so same kinds of things. I also wanted it to meet that target that the publisher had of being a beautifully illustrated souvenir book on ancient glass so that visitors could walk away with some wonderful illustrations of the type. I don't know why it's doing this, but we get to see all these points multiple times. And finally, um, as a scholar of Roman glass, it really presented for me the opportunity to republish pictures of the Oppenlender collection that hadn't been seen since 1974. So the photography, much of the photography in that book was in black and white, and this was really a chance to present this material in color. So chapter one really focuses on the question, what is glass? It provides an overview of what the raw materials are that go into making glass talks about the tools and techniques that were developed in antiquity, and includes citations of ancient authors who actually talk about glass, like Pliny and Strabo. And the next series of chapters really examines the techniques of glass that were developed in antiquity. And of course, all of these techniques are still being used by glass artists today. So it's a very strong foundation for studio glass making. And in doing this, I was able to take care of something that had always bothered me as a glass scholar. When I had been uh, reading other books about Roman glass and reading descriptions of glass making techniques, they were often accompanied by illustrations, uh, which I always felt were sadly lacking because they left out key points in the process. So this gave me an opportunity to introduce some new technical drawings to the field at large. So here you see the illustrations for casting, for core forming, showing all of the various steps. And then finally, for mosaic glass making. And uh, we uh, cheated a little bit in doing these illustrations because what we did was to go to the uh, videos that had been made here at Corning in the studio with Bill Gudenrath, some of which were on view in the gallery at the Getty Villa so that visitors could see those videos directly adjacent to the types of glass they were looking at. So we used stills from those videos and converted them 
into drawing. So all of those hands you see are Bill's, actually. <laughs> I don't know if Bill knows that. I better tell him at some point. But in addition to uh, manufacturing techniques, I really wanted to bring in some topics that weren't often covered in general books on ancient glass to address the question of the economics of the glass industry in antiquity, to talk about regional styles, which is kind of a challenge in ancient glass, and to, again, talk about and, and show examples of how glass was used in antiquity. So the, first, the next chapters really delved into those topics. Uh, and for the economics of the ancient glass industry, I really started at the very beginning. The centers of the earliest glass production in Mesopotamia and Egypt, how glass was made uh, both as a commodity and shipped out as ingots uh, around the ancient Mediterranean. We know this, of course, from the 14th century BC Ulu Burun shipwreck that was found off the southern coast of Turkey, uh, but also with finished vessels. So the, these kinds of archaeological remains give us some wonderful insight into how glass was being used as a commodity, what impact it had on the economy of the ancient world. I also identified centers of glass making in antiquity. Uh, I mentioned that the earliest ones were in Mesopotamia and Egypt. Um, but slowly, slowly, as glass became more popular and more interested to different cultures, the centers of glass making spread along the coast of the Eastern Mediterranean. We have archaeological evidence of the glass industry on the island of Rhodes, for example. So more and more glass making centers began to trickle westward. And finally, to uh, talk about what the glass vessels themselves tell us how, about how they were used based on their shape and their decoration. So an example of that in particular is really to talk about souvenirs. I think anyone who's been to a sporting event or any kind of public gathering where souvenirs are sold uh, can uh, empathize with the, the Roman who is doing the same thing. I'm showing you here two pieces in the collection at Corning that are actually religious souvenirs. They were made in the Holy Land. They were sold to pilgrims who were coming and visiting the Holy Shrines and wanted to bring back home a memento. So the bottle on the top has a, whoops, sorry, let's get back, whoop, we're jumping, there we go, has a cross in its design here. So this was meant for Christian pilgrims. And on the bottom, the multiple-owned decoration is a menorah. So they were hitting all targets, all possible religious targets with these wares. Uh, another example that the Getty does not have in its collection, but that you can find here in Corning, uh, relates to gladiatorial events and circus events. Uh, the glassmakers were making glass cups that had pictures of gladiators fighting with their names inscribed over their heads. So, you want to go to a basketball game, or, uh, yeah, a basketball game, and get your favorite sports hero T-shirt or a mug with his picture on it. It's the same kind of thing. It started with the Romans. Everything started with the Romans. I'm convinced. Uh, but another thing that examination of the objects combined with archaeological evidence can tell us is where some of these vessels were actually made and marketed. And for glass, this is a particularly challenging topic. Because the glass was so widely distributed during the Roman period, and because the analysis of the elements used to make the glass can't give us a lot of information. Remember I told you that the glass itself as a commodity was shipped around the Mediterranean. So you might be able to determine where that raw glass was made, but then it was shaped into a vessel in some completely different place. So the analysis of the material wasn't going to tell us where something was made necessarily. So there are, there are a few examples that we can go to to talk about regional style and production. And this group of drinking cups, uh, they're called Rippenschale, uh, is one of them. These are beautiful little small hemispherical bowls that are made and found only in northern Italy and Switzerland. So this is a great example of distinctly regional taste. Another uh, is the vessels that you see on the screen here. And the two on the left uh, are in the collection of the Getty Museum. Before the Oppenlander collection was purchased by the Getty, this piece was already in the collection. It had come in in 1985. Uh, and with the purchase of the Oppenlander collection, 
we then acquired a second example of exactly the same type of mold blown glass. And here you can see that Corning has one as well. It's a very small group. There's only about seven or eight that have survived um, in this particular pattern. But what makes them distinctive and interesting is the shape of their handle. And you can see that it's kind of a wishbone that sprouts off the vessel itself, and then it's pinched all the way down. There happens to be another vessel in Corning's collection that has exactly the same kind of handle design. And David Whitehouse wrote an article about this small group a few years ago in which he located them uh, as being made in Syria, probably in the third or fourth century AD. So with the detective work that David did on this group, we can attribute all of the pieces in this group to that region and that time, whether we know what their archeological context was or not. So these are examples that are few and far between, but they tell us a lot about the Roman glass industry. The last chapter really showed multiple examples of the diverse uses of glass in the ancient world, all of which are gonna look very familiar to you, I'm sure beginning with personal adornment, because from the very beginnings, glass was used uh, as pieces of jewelry. And on the left, there's a beautiful little pair of gold glass earrings with little ducks or something in them. And they're actually mounted into bronze, which is what that corroded green surround is here. Uh, and in the Oppenlender collection, there was also a wonderful string of mosaic glass beads. The majority of vessels, of course, were made for cooking, drinking, and eating. Uh, and there are a wide variety of those types of pieces in the Oppenlender collection. Glass was also used in architecture in the ancient world uh, when it was used as glass tesserae in mosaics. This is something that we don't have here in Corning in the collection. So I uh, brought in a mosaic from the Getty collection and this is a mosaic that's actually made using a combination of stone and glass. Glass was used to infill colors that were very hard to find in nature in stone. So on this mosaic, it's actually the dripping blood out of the back of this poor animal that's being attacked by the lion that are glass tesserae, they're red glass tesserae. Uh, and the red was achieved by adding copper to the batch to give it a reddish color when it was uh, finished. And over the centuries, the copper actually patinates much like your copper cooking pots do. So some of these tesserae are now green. And in fact, we have some pieces on display upstairs that are doing exactly the same thing. Glass, as today, was used as works of art, and Corning, of course, has one of the finest examples of that in its collection, the Statuette of Venus, which was originally green. I don't know how many of you recognize this, but this is the original color of the glass. What you're seeing on top of it now is simply a corrosion layer, which is flesh-colored, which is great. It's the right color. <laughs> Could have been something worse, but uh, what we're left with is really a stunning example of sculptural art. Glass was used for lighting, of course, and there were a few examples in the Oppenlender collection of these hemispherical cups that were part of a larger chandelier ensemble. So these would have been filled with oil that would have been lit to illuminate your dining room. And glass was also used for burial. There is a, a large body of urns, two-handled lidded urns like this that were actually used for cremation burials. The individual would be cremated, their remains would be placed inside these urns, and then they would be deposited in an underground tomb. So as I left the Getty and came to Corning, I was leaving behind a fabulous collection of Roman glass, but really walking right into a completely more fabulous collection of glass to work with. But I have to say, this is a job that I love to do. This is one of my favorite things to do every day, is to walk through, to look at the Roman glass, whether at the Getty or at Corning, to appreciate the diversity, to appreciate the beauty, to think about the people who made it, the people who used it. All so many questions that I love to ask myself every day. And finally, I would like to end by thanking the Getty Museum for allowing me to use images of pieces in their collection, and in particular, Claire Lyons, Sally Hibbard, and Carolyn Simmons, and here at Corning, Marie McKee and Tom Knotts for helping me to put together this PowerPoint collection. 
So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed that, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have for a few minutes. But if you do have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone, because we are live streaming, so we want to be able to record your question as well. Open here. So um, I collect first edition books, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of preservation techniques I should be using that I'm not. Okay. <laughs> and my question for you is what, is, what preservation techniques do you need to use with glass? Well, the first and foremost thing that you have to do is provide a stable environment. You have to control the temperature, and you have to control the humidity. And if you can do that, you can keep it in excellent condition because the enemies of glass are really changes in one or the other of those things. So the important thing is to get that environment stable. And even if a piece is in trouble, if it's really getting iridized and flaking, you can kind of halt the process right there. Uh, ancient glass doesn't have the problem of crizzling that later glass has. It does deteriorate, but it's not a, a similar problem. So um, really, what we do first and foremost, as I said, is temperature and humidity. Other questions? Yes. Carol, the mold blown uh, objects mm -hmm. that you had pieces at the Getty Museum, as well as the objects that we have here at mm -hmm. the Corny Museum, the one, the Roman ones with the, the heads, mm -hmm. is there a thought? or a theory that those came from the same mold? Yes, indeed, okay. indeed. Okay. Uh, actually, my dissertation research was really very much about that topic, taking measurements of the same types of beakers to see how many might have been made in the same mold, or to try and learn something about the molds themselves, because in reality, we have very, very few mold pieces that have survived. And for the most part, it's simply the base of the vessel mold that survives, not the sidewalls. And we know from examining the vessels that there were a lot of variety in how the molds were put together and how many pieces were actually used to make some of these vessels. The simplest just had two side pieces that went around the bubble and were released from the bubble. Um, those head flasks that I showed are exactly that type. You can see the seam mark sort of running down the side of the head, bisecting the ears. Um, but for some of the more complex pieces, like for example the Enion pieces that we have on view upstairs, those had a base mold that wasn't just the bottom, it was actually the bottom cup. And then there are two or three side panels, and in the case of the pitcher, there's even more pieces that go on top of that. So we're lacking those mold pieces to really understand what the materials were that were used to make the mold, how they were held together when they were manufacturing these things, all these scintillating questions. It's, it's, dri it's been driving me mad for 20 years, I have to say. <laughs> the question of the molds. And then like on the, the molds that she's talking about, <laughs> did every glass worker kind of come up with their own configuration of handles and how they affix them as their own personal signature or stamp? And that's how you can kind of track them back to the same collections also? Is that how they do that? That is one way. Um, yes, the handle designs are often unique, and they can be looked at as a diagnostic tool to try and identify a workshop. We have very few artist names that are known. I mentioned Enion, and it's really only in the mold-blown pieces that we have surviving names because they were incorporated into the mold design itself. But often a signature method is, as you say, the handles. And there's only one secure workshop that's been identified. Uh, a scholar named Marianne Stern identified a corpus of vessels that were made utilizing the same handle construction. And she called it the workshop of the floating handles, because the handles were attached starting at the top of the neck of the vessel, and then they were drawn up and brought down. But they were never reattached at the bottom. So they're actually sitting off the surface of the vessel. I haven't located them upstairs yet, but I know that there are examples of that in the collection here. So it's kind of a, a scary way to make a handle, not to attach it in two pieces, but perhaps these were pieces that were not meant to be handled frequently. They may have been indeed um, identified as grave goods, pieces that were never going to be handled in life.
What have you learned from studying the ancient glass that can be used in modern glass making right now that, that isn't being used? So I want to make sure I understand exactly what you're asking. What can we see in ancient glass that we cannot see in modern glass making today? It's possible. Know. Some of the techniques oh, sure. uh, or yeah. um, some of the uh, chemicals, uh, chemical makeup of the batch that, that you see in and can be used now, or, or should be used now, or tried to be used now, that isn't being done yet? Well, the mold making that I was just talking about is the one I'm waiting for, <laughs> I have to say, because there are a lot of uh, artists like Bill Gudenrath and like Mark Taylor and David Hill in the UK who spend a lot of their time studying ancient pieces to try and understand how they were made. Uh, and uh, through trial and error, through studying the ancient pieces, looking at tool marks, doing that analysis of the materials used to make them, they have come close to figuring it out. But we don't know for sure if what they're doing today was indeed what was happening in the ancient world. Uh, the majority of glassmakers today are really doing the whole variety of glassmaking that was done in antiquity. There are very few examples that haven't been replicated or turned into some modern interpretation of an ancient style. Um, but the recipes, the batches, they're all unique. They're all, whether ancient or modern, they're, they're all made for the day, for the piece that's being made. You know, Cameo and, and lead crystal is still having a high lead content today, just as it did in antiquity to make it easier to cut. So I think a lot of the lessons that were learned as they were developed in the ancient world are still being followed today. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. There's one way in the back. Um, <clears throat> you may have answered this, but I didn't catch it. Um, what, what materials did they use for the molds? Well, this is the big challenge. Uh, we have, surviving from antiquity, examples of clay and of stone. Uh, in addition to that, there is a bronze vessel, a very thin-walled bronze cup that has the same patterns on it that you see on glass vessels. And we know from uh, unique pieces, uh, like a, a beautiful little cup in the British Museum, that metal could be used with glass. Uh, it's a piece that was actually in reflecting antiquity when it was here a very small silver cup through, uh, with ovals cut out of that silver shell, and then the glass was inflated through that to create a little lotus bud pattern on the outside. So we know metal could be used with glass in antiquity, and whether this one bronze piece that has the same pattern on it as glass vessels was actually a mold, we're not exactly sure. Um, but as glassmakers today use materials, this is where we start our investigation. We know that plaster is used. Uh, we know that wood can be used, but organic materials really don't survive that well from the ancient world. And I'm still waiting for that wonderful excavation that's going to find my mold pieces and answer that question for me. Any more? Well, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. I think everybody will agree we're very lucky to have Carol join our staff and our family here. We're very happy about this. I hope you will all stay and um, perhaps have further questions that you would like to talk to Carol about. And if you love that book, we are actually selling it outside. We'll be happy to have Carol um, autograph it for you. Or if you brought one, she'll be happy to do so. Really thank you for coming today. Really happy to see so many pe members here and look forward to seeing you uh, through the holidays. Thank you so much.